Since we last met, uh, since we last talked here, um, you published uh, a while ago this successful book called Acid Drops, which yeah. is a your collection of sort of verbal put downs, I suppose, the best generals. Yes, I, I thought tart retorts, but the, somebody else said no, acid drops is better because yeah. the tartness is in the acidity and the drop about them being put out, put down, so to speak, is in acid drops. So I thought it was a better title. Yeah. Well, why, why, but why did you pick that particular kind of art form to be that to, to write about? Why well, I picked it because it, the, I've, been, I've done a lot of these quote unquote shows. Yes. And Giles Brander, who was editing this book, said to me, you obviously enjoy, don't you, the malignant thrust and the rude retort. And he said, you do deliver them with a degree of relish. And I said, yes, I do enjoy them. And he said, why don't we do a book all about them? So that's, what, that's how it all occurred. Because I'd gone along to the programme for quote-unquote with my various uh, bits and pieces. And the producer always said, bring quite a few, because we may find that what you think is funny is not broadcastable. And, um, and so, and one almost had to have quite a few spares, you know. But I remember taking along to him one, which I thought was a lovely one, and that was a true account. Stanley Baxter told me in a London club he'd heard two men, and one said, I've just come from Evita. And the other one said, oh, you don't look very brown. <laughs> I remember thinking that was a marvellous one, but he said, no, it's not what we want. So I put that in my spare book, you know. And I put a lot of other spare things in the diaries, which I keep, because I've kept them since I was 14. But when did you did discover this, this liking, or indeed your talent for what you describe as the malignant, malignant thrust? Well, I suppose because I've so often been a victim, do you see, of aggression. And I found very early on in life, I'm a small person, and I found very early on in life that if you didn't have the the sort of retort that was necessary to put down people who were rude uh, and bullying, then you couldn't do it in any other way. I mean, you couldn't do it. I, could, I had to do it verbally. I couldn't do it physically. You started as a, as a schoolboy, then? Yes, I think that was the first occasion, yes. I used to use the tongue to be vituperative. But the malignant th thrust of the tongue often gets you wallop round the ear all. I mean, did you need a, a bodyguard? Mm, yes, I always had one you handy. Did. <laughs> yes, I, I cultivated the friendship of very big people. <laughs> and um, I got very well in with the captain of the school uh, football team and, and the captain of the cricket team. I got in well with all those big chaps. And I thoroughly enjoy them. They'd always bash people for me, you see. <laughs> and I love that. I did it in the army as well. I always kept well in the area of protection from those sort of people. Mm. What about when, in compiling the book? Did you, in fact, come across any one section of the of the um, of life in which it was the the put down was more uh, rich in area than than others? I mean, is it I don't know theatre? Is it the politics? Is it well, no, I think it covers almost everything. I mean, I love that Deaf E. Smith one, you know, where he, after a lengthy preamble in front of the judge, the judge said, I've listened to your arguments, they are very lengthy, and I'm none, frankly, Mr. Smith, I'm none the wiser. And he's no, my lord, but doubtless better informed. <laughs> and that, I find, is a... I, I, I think that's a marvellous put-down mm. that is essentially erudite. It belongs very much to the realm of mm. uh, the legal system. There's also, of course, in the book, there's a marvellous collection of, uh, of quotes and incidents uh, of, of theatrical characters, rich theatrical characters. Yes, there are, uh, but there are several that I, I wanted to do and then thought afterwards, oh, I should have put that and forgot, you know what I mean? And that will have to be in the next edition. They're having a reprint, incidentally, so that's very nice to know because they've sold them all. And so we're having to do it all again. And one that I really would have loved to have been in, because I think it's a marvellous put down, and in a sense, it's, it's, it's the essence of theatre. And it was told me by Jeremy Swan, who knew the man that was in charge of this company. It was Robert Heltman doing a tour of uh, this ballet, Midsummer Night's Dream, and he was playing Oberon, and they played it in a, in a vast sports arena. It was floodlit. And every actor, of course, or dancer or whatever, was given um, rooms which were essentially for sports people, and they gave Robert Heltman what they thought was the best room, the umpire's room, and when the man came around the half, he knocks on the door and says, half an hour please, half an hour please, he didn't get any answer, and he went in and found in this umpire's room Robert Heltman on a chair which was on the table. So he was up on this chair on the table with a mirror against the one naked light bulb doing this very elaborate eye makeup, which was green and gold, 
I was up there doing this, and he said, are you all right? And Robert Hopkins said, yes, I'm fine, but God knows how these umpires manage. Conveys that wonderful sense of theatre. People who are in the theatre imagine, do they not, that the world revolves about that mm. particular mm. area and not about any other. Edith Evans was comparable because she had this extraordinary ability to rise above any kind of adversity. I remember after Gentle Jack, there was terrible booing and shouting, and she said to me as the curtain fell, Well, I heard one bravo. And I said, No, that was go home. <laughs> When we came out of the theatre, she said to me, did they give you any notes? And I said, yes, I got a couple of notes. Did they give you any? And she said, well, Binky said, Hardy Amy's has designed very regal costumes. You should look equally regal in them. <laughs> should you think that's justified? And I said, no, I think any criticism of your deportment is tantamount to impertinence. And she said, yes. <laughs> You're a very pleasant young man. <laughs> and there's no reason why the right girl shouldn't come along. <laughs> Which obviously she regarded as the reward for any sort of virtue. <laughs> then we got into the taxi and got back to this hotel where we were staying. And we were the only two because everyone else had dined, you know, we were... Well, it was 11 o'clock at night, you know, and everyone else had gone. But these two tin plates were over a bit of cold ham and lettuce. And we sat in the corner of this empty room. And an old fart, who was the night porter, <laughs> was the night porter, who was deputising both as night porter and waiter, came in and said to Dame Edith, Your partner in crime's had a grub. <laughs> and the partner in crime was her advisor on spiritual matters. <laughs> accompanied her on this tour. Well, she was a Christian scientist That's right. and would not take any medicines but believed that spiritual faith would resolve any kind of illness. And he said, your partner in crime's had her grub. She couldn't wait about till half past 11 when you were starting. But she said she might want a drop of wine. Do you fancy a drop? And she said, oh, yes, a half bottle of Beaujolais <laughs> would not come amiss. He said, I thought you'd fancy that. <laughs> Got a drop in the sideboard for you, and, and bent over to get it, and and then broke wind with alarming, <laughs> alarming <laughs> ferocity. It really rang out appallingly. And, and she said to me, "This place has gone off very." <laughs> and, and I thought, I thought that would be a great composure, great composure and presence of mind. And it's, it's something, I think, which is, it does run through theatre, because I recall when I first worked with Maggie Smith in television, they did a thing called Acting in the 60s, and I said to her afterwards, you're extraordinarily relaxed, aren't you? I mean, the head was so, so relaxed. And she said, oh, that's because I had so many fillings, my head's top-heavy with lead. It keeps, <laughs> it keeps falling forward. And when we went to Fortnum and Mason, where she was after a particular kind of bra, a very grand assistant in Fortnum's, which was heavy carpeting, beautiful, uh, very soft pile, you hardly heard as you entered. This woman said, yes, I have that particular bra, ma'am, and she said it was seven guineas. And, and Max said, seven guineas for a bra? Mm. She put up your tits off. <laughs> the place, the place that was an uproar, I obviously they've never heard anyone. <laughs> being quite so forthright <laughs> before in that kind of establishment.